What's going on gamers, it's Felich here from Beneath the Veil and welcome back to the channel. This week I wanted to go over summons heroes and introducing players that are new to micro heroes to the concept of micro and zoo heroes and trying to demystify a few of the misconceptions that I've seen around the difficulty of this group of heroes. So first of all, I want to go through a couple of key settings that will help a lot of players get into the core aspects of micro heroes without needing to necessarily dive into the depths of control groups and then as a video goes on, we'll show you more advanced strategies that you can start utilizing. If you go into your settings, you'll see initially you've got a few things here. So the core things to look at are in your unit actions. You want a select hero key bound to something, and then you want select all hero, all controlled units bound to some sort of key. In my, in my case, I've got select hero bound to space, just because I like having my space bar as a home point to come back to just my hero. And then I have my numeral one key as select all controlled units. So that will select every single unit that I have control of. So that's all of my summons, any Helm of the Dominator creep that I might have, as well as my hero. If we keep looking in this main page here, if we go over to our control groups, the main thing I want to focus on is the next unit. I'll get to that later, but in my case, and I think by default it's bound to tab, you can, if you want to, bind some of these other keys as well, but you don't have to. The other really important thing to do is go to Advanced Hotkeys. And then if we look in the section here, we need to have Select All Other Units bound to a key. So in my case, I've got it bound to number two. So what that means is if I just use the first three hotkeys we talked about, I can have my hero selected by using space. I can have everything including my hero selected by pressing 1. Now if I want everything but my hero selected then I can press 2. Okay so that's really the bare bones of what you need to get into micro heroes and then I'll show you some other tricks that you can do with your other hotkeys if you want to get into that. So the biggest misconception I see about micro or zoo heroes is that their creeps are inherently the strongest aspect of them. It's actually generally the auras that buff their summons that make them the strongest. If we look at Beastmaster, for example, he's got wild axes that do a certain amount of damage as they go through, but then with each successive cast that hits, there's damage amplification that goes along with that. So that's a way that Beastmaster can scale. The most important thing is that he's got this inner beast passive here which in a 1200 range around Beastmaster increases the attack speed of all nearby allies. So that is heroes and most importantly creeps. The next thing I want to go over is sort of a classification that I draw in my head between summons heroes who do what I call map domination and then heroes that will split push. What I mean by map domination is that there are heroes like Beastmaster that like to basically only play in this portion of the map. So what they will do is they will take their offlane tower first and then they will kind of bounce between the tier 2 and the tier 1 mid. And they will do things like farm all of these camps here. And then they will slowly start to push in. And they will just absorb all of these camps here. Which will end up kicking out position 1 of the enemy team. So that they can only really farm on this side of the map. And they're you know, sort of forced to play over here. Depending on what their team is doing. If they're playing correctly and taking the tier 1. Then that gives them a bit more freedom to start playing this side of the map. But your job as a conventional offlaner is to just swallow up this side of the map and kick the enemy out. The thing you have to keep in mind with summons heroes is that they do have a tempo. So they like to hit that either a level 6 timing where they get their summons or if they get their summons from another ability. They typically like something like a Helm of the Dominator. And then you'll have heroes like Lycan, like a Beastmaster, to an extent like Visage. But he sits somewhere in the middle where they like to sit in a certain area of the map and just play that. And um, you have other heroes like Nature's Prophet, for instance, that like to um, sit on the outskirts of the map and constantly pressure the outside lanes. So if we move on to more advanced tricks with each hero with Beastmaster, so you do have obviously his boars. If you have a hotkey assigned to the boars themselves, anytime Beastmaster summons a boar, they will all get tied into the same control group. So for me, I have my first customizable control group set as numeral three. So if I summon in a bunch of boars, all you do to assign it is you just hit hold control and then hit the control group that you want to assign them to. So in this case, I have it as set three. If you were to do this just with the first boar, then it would only select the first boar, but then any other boars you summon are after that, they'll all be assigned to three. So if I hit three, I get everything. If I hit two, I still have all of my boars. And then if I hit 1, I have all my balls and Beastmaster. If I hit space, I have just Beastmaster. If you get a Helm of the Dominator, 
So now if I hit one, I have all of my troops here and I can hit tab just to tab through them. So I got a Wildwing Ripper and then a bunch of boars and then I can go back to Beastmaster. If I hit my numeral two, then I have just the boars and the Wildwing Ripper. And then if I hit three, then I have just the boars. If I hit four, in my case, I have it assigned just to whatever my dominated creepers. So I can control that one individually. The reason I do that is that whenever I have the Dark Troll Summoner summons additional creeps, I like to have him selected on an independent hotkey so that I can select him, summon some creeps, and then run him away, and then I just box the skeletons and then send them down a lane. So that's that's the reason for having that additional hotkey. Also, there's other things that you can do when, say, if you're chasing an unhero and you want to use a particular creep to body block, in that case, I could start using my dominated creep to do that job for me if I wanted to, while the rest of the boars apply a slow and all that sort of stuff. So that's Beastmaster. Next, I'll go over Lycan, and if you're ever in demo terrain and you want to change over, you can just go up to this top control here, and you can select any hero, and it will spawn in a new hero. So if I find Lycan here, that brings in Lycan at level 1, I can scale up to whatever level I like. So with Lycan, the main things to consider is that his ability that buffs summons the most is his Feral Impulse. That increases HP regen and damage of Lycan and all other units under his control. So this does spread onto Helm of the Dominator creeps, and then obviously the two wolves that you summon through Summon Wolves. So that's something to be aware of, is that it gives additional damage and it gives bonus HP regen. The benefit of this ability in particular is that it's not tied to a range, so this is just permanently on. So Lycan can be a little bit more effective than Beastmaster can in split pushing, because his auras aren't tied to his location. So you can do things as Lycan where you can summon some wolves and you can throw them down a lane. And then if you want, you can be over here farming creeps while you're waiting to see how the enemy react to the creeps. And then if they do pressure these creeps for whatever reason, I can just select the control group for the creeps and I can run them away. What I also like to do with Lycan is that I like to have number two for all units. Then I have three selected as just one of the wolves. The reason I like to do that is that if I sick you know, everything including Lycan onto a player, then I can have one of the wolves run a bit further ahead. These tend to be faster than heroes, so you can quite easily end up body blocking while your hero and your other summon creeps slowly chase him down and deal damage to them. The other thing with Lycan is that he does have his Howl ability, which is an active ability. So what this will do is, during the daytime it's in an area around Lycan, but then during the night it is global. That's something to be aware of, is that if you are split pushing, for example, and the and, and your team are taking a fight somewhere at night time, you can just pop Howl to give them a little bit of extra damage through reducing the enemy's armor, as well as reducing the amount of damage that the enemy is doing. Otherwise, in a 2000 range of Lycan and his wolves, um, you can apply this debuff. So I can have one of my wolves attacking something. If I have this wolf over here, and I go back to Lycan and apply it how, you can see that all of these enemies are debuffed. So that's something to keep in mind with Lycan, is that his active ability applies an aura in, an, in a range of both his hero and his units, whereas the hero, like a Beastmaster, his auras are tied directly to the hero itself. Um, so Lycan, similar to Beastmaster, is a hero that generally likes to dominate the map, so he will mainly play between the offlane and mid. He will tend to not buy boots, and only try and take fights whenever his shapeshift is up. The reason for that is he runs at hasted speed during his ult, and then he gets additional damage, he gets additional nighttime vision. So yeah, generally he likes to fight while this is up, and then whenever his ult isn't up, he's looking to just push in lanes. He, like a Beastmaster, likes to typically get a Helm of the Overlord, and then he likes to build up a little bit of a creep army and then sort of take over the enemy side of the jungle. Okay, so if we go to Broodmother now, she is a hero that, similarly to Lycan and Beastmaster, likes to generally take over the offlane in mid and then sort of play that from there. What she does is she likes to use her ult to build up the creep army, so the main thing with Brood is that she is very mana dependent in the early game, so you'd see that if I didn't have free spells on. Then in the process of building up this army, and the process of building up a web network, she will inherently start to burn through her mana. So you want things like Soul Ring and Arcane Boots to keep her topped up. Brood doesn't have auras the same way that Lycan and Beastmaster do to buff her creeps, but whenever her spiderlings are on the webs, they are very strong. So she is a hero that likes to build up a web network and then play on her web network. The other benefit is that she gets free pathing during all of this as well, so that can really play to her benefit. You know, as she moves forward, she can start to you know, move forward on the map, build up an area, 
And then you can either just place new webs, or if you've had to run away, for example, and place web back here, and you don't want your oldest web to expire first, you can just go over box select a web, and then just hit the hotkey to remove it. As I move through the map, I can end up doing a little bit of admin as a micro hero, and you can start building up your network so that you're playing a little bit further up the map wherever you need. So with Brood, she's always looking to build a spiderling army and then mass select them and then move through. If you notice that a bunch of your spiderlings are about to expire, what you can do, go into your settings and then you go into options and you go into advanced options, you can enable console. And what that will enable you to do is if you have a console hotkey selected, which is an advanced hotkeys console, so I've got mine as backslash, you can go backslash and then it will pull up the console and you can go dota underscore selection underscore groups and by default it's true you want to change that to false what that will enable you to do is if i then quit out console if i get in a bunch of spider links here what you can end up doing is that you if you select brood mother first and then you tab through then you'll select individual spiders so i can start just right clicking all over the map and I can send an army of spiderlings to go and do some bidding and do some scouting for me. And then I can carry on with whatever I've got left. I can go in and continue farming, continue pushing, doing whatever I want to do. And you can see that all of these are slowly spreading out. So I've got one over here, one's running through here. So you can use broodlings, spiderlings as movable wards. But that's something that you can do with brood that you can't necessarily do as well with heroes like Lycan and Beastmaster just because you don't have the huge amount of creeps to uh, exploit that way, like you do with Brood when you're spawning in Spiderlings and spider mites. So yeah, Brood typically likes to play that style of taking over the map. She will constantly be trying to knock down enemy towers and forcing rotations. And that's the strength of these heroes, is that if people don't respect the summons heroes and rotate to defend them, then you just end up taking free objectives all the time. So before we get into the playstyle of each hero, let's carry on and go over Nature's Prophet and Visage. Okay, so with Nature's Prophet, I'm sure that many people have faced this hero. The thing that makes him exceptionally strong is that he does have a teleportation spell. So he can go anywhere on the map after a cast time of 3 seconds, and then as you level this up, the cooldown will decrease. So this allows Nature's Prophet to really easily be anywhere on the map, and then he can summon tree ants from trees. By using nature's call so depending on what level it is it will summon anywhere between two to five tree ants and then you can get a talent to give additional tree ants as well i believe it's at level 15 yeah you can get five additional on top so at max you can get 10. this is really strong for splitting the map so nature's profit is really good at applying consistent pressure on the outskirts of the map the reason you want to do that is that it's very easy to rotate into the center of the map from anywhere because so it's much harder to rotate to the outskirts if somebody is playing up here and suddenly you're pushing down here they have to move all the way over, and then conversely, if you immediately switch to forcing down this lane, then they've then got to come all the way back. So the time to rotate is much longer when you're going side to side as opposed to going to the center. It's going to be about the same no matter, no matter where you are. So Nature's Prophet is a hero that likes to split the map. He doesn't have any abilities like the other summons heroes do that give him that ability to amp up the pressure that his summons create. That's for balance reasons, because he creates pressure through forcing them to split up so that sort of you know indirectly his teleportation spell gives him a pseudo aura in that it forces pressure to be anywhere on the map depending on where he wants it to be this is also really good because he's a hero that naturally can rotate to fights really easily because he just teleports in um, whereas heroes like Lycan Beastmaster and Visage as well have a much harder time connecting to fights Brood also does if, she, if it's the fight's not happening in a web network go over Visage last so Visage is a hero like Broodmother who hit a huge power spike when they hit level 6 I will level Visage up to level 7 just for the case of looking at Grave Chill. Visage doesn't have auras in the same way that Beastmaster does or the same way that Lycan does. He has a aura which will provide protection to his familiar. So what Gravekeeper's Cloak does is depending on the level that it's at, it will provide a certain amount of uh, damage reduction per layer. So at level 1 it provides 8 per layer giving 32% total reduction at max layers. At level 2 it gives 12 which multiplies out to 48% damage reduction at max layers. At level 3 that's 16 which is 64% at 
max layers and then it maxed out it gives 80 percent damage reduction at max layers the important thing to know about this is that this will extend to the familiars themselves so they are being protected by gravekeeper's cloak so when this is maxed out it will mean that your familiars will take 80 percent less damage of what's dealt to them provided that visage keeps the layers so the only way for the layers to be removed is for visage to take instances of damage past a certain threshold it'll take a layer off and then after four seconds the layer will return typically with visage you want to play visage on the end of the fight keeping your familiars out in front um, so that you're not taking damage to keep their damage reduction high and then the other thing you want to do is use grave chill so grave chill is also visage's farming ability so this is something that's really important to max out early on and what that enables you to do is steal move speed and attack speed from an enemy unit this can be a hero or a creep and then that will grant it to you and your familiars so you can see here that if the familiars go and attack they will do a certain amount of damage you know they've got a certain interval that they're attacking at if i use grave chill then you see that that rapidly increases so they end up doing a lot more damage very quickly and then what you can you know so you can do other things like that where if i'm farming with them i just leech off the centaur and then the creeps will continue to just attack me so long as I'm in the vicinity, otherwise they will turn on the creeps. So typically with Visage you just let your familiars do all the farming, and you just use Grave Chill whenever it's up, and then they will end up doing all of the damage for you. So with Visage, he is a hero that doesn't rotate as well as heroes like Nature's Prophet, because once the summons are up, they're up. So he typically wants to keep his summons up. The only time you might consider rotating is if you have your ultimate off of cooldown then you can very easily rotate and spawn new birds and then you can carry on with a fight thing to know about the birds if you do get a second point in summon familiars your familiar level will stay at whatever level it's at when they were summoned so if you want the new increased damage you do have to respawn them the other thing to keep in mind is that the birds stone form ability they are all in independent cooldowns so this bird has an independent cooldown to this one and then you know say i burn both of those and then i summon two new birds then they have new cooldowns of that stone form again so in a team fight if you really need and you have your ultimate up and your birds are already with you you can use the two stone forms and then you can resummon the birds again to use two more stone forms instantly sometimes you need those additional stuns sometimes you don't but it's good to know. Other good things to know is that Visage does have on his hero an individual stone form hotkey that will cause the bird that is closest to Visage to use stone form first and the one that's further away. So I do always recommend individually binding your birds to a, an independent hotkey otherwise you can select all hero unit, uh, all other units and then have both birds and you can tab through them depending. The reason you might want to do this is that if Visage is silenced or stunned or anything that is controlled in any sort of way then he can't use this spell to activate that, whereas if the birds aren't silenced or controlled in any way, then they can use their independent ability. So sometimes you do need to individually select the bird to use the stun, and other times you can still be selecting visage and use that ability as well. So next one I want to cover is early game strategy for these summons heroes, covering what I call a ding dong ditch playstyle. Which is basically what you essentially want to do is with heroes like Broodmother and Visage, you want to play reasonably conservative in the lane until you hit level 6, and then level 6 is your huge power spike, where then what you want to start doing is trying to knock down as many towers as you can as quickly as you can, and punishing a lack of rotations whenever it occurs. With Visage, so I've just leveled up to level 6, so typically I'll take a point in Q, uh, a point in W, and then a point in E, and then I'll go and try and max out Grave Chill, and obviously at level 6 take the familiars. So the second familiars arrive, I take them, and then I just start Grave Chilling the wave, and just pushing it in as quickly as humanly possible. If you have your position 4 playing around you as well, then you can end up really easily bullying the position 5, and then kicking the position 1 out of lane so that you can then really quickly take this tower. The other thing to know about Visage is that Gravekeeper's Cloak doesn't protect from tower damage, so they will still take full tower damage, so you do need to be aware of that, and constantly playing around the towers as a result, and not going underneath the towers without other creeps to protect your beds. So here we go in, and now I'm just putting more and more damage on whenever I can. So the archer's about to die, so I fly the birds out. You start to learn after a while where the sweet spot is, where you can just stay under the tower and let the birds take some damage. But until that point, let's keep going. So right before this archer dies, I'm going to grave chill it. And I'm going to use that additional attack speed to then take down this tower. 
So you see at level 6 you can do it within 3 creep waves, so that's within a minute. You can just melt a tower if the enemy don't come protect it adequately. And then similarly if there was a hero that showed up like a crystal maiden that's trying to hold onto the tower, I can just grave chill the crystal maiden and just suck the birds on them, and if they don't have a hard stun, they're going to have a really difficult time dealing with familiar. So again, and then I'm just doing the same thing. So all I'm doing is I'm knocking on the front door, and I'm waiting to see if there's any resistance, and then if there is, then I'm just backing off. Provided that it's enough resistance that I can't win in a straight up fight. If it's just one hero, then depending on the hero, if I know that I can kill them, I'll put a bunch of damage onto them. You spam soul assumption whenever you get three bars above Visage's head in this case, and then as that levels up you get more and more damage depending on how much damage is being dealt. Um, but yeah, you just continue to knock on the front door every time, and then whenever they're not defending you just put damage onto the tower, and you'll be surprised how much you end up taking off. If you get a rotation of like three or four heroes, then that's your sign to back out, and then what you do is you end up in the similar way that you do with Broodmother or Beastmaster or Lycan. You go and knock on the front door of the mid tower instead, and then you'd meet up with your your team. You go and take a team fight. If a team fight happens around you, that's great, but you're not somebody that rotates two fights. You're the one that causes fights to rotate to you because otherwise you just thread an objective far too strongly. So same thing here. If there was a bunch of attention top, then I just rotate mid force them all back mid, and then we either take a team fight and win and take the tower, or if uh, our team isn't strong enough to take the fight, then we back off, we slowly rotate back up top, and then you can do things like hit these camps if you wanted to. I'm more of a fan of constantly pushing, putting aggressive pressure on, and then the second that I force a rotation, then I would come back and then I would farm camps like this on my way back out. But that's just my playstyle, it all depends on what rank you're in, how successful you're going to be in those approaches too and lower ranks especially, they'll tend to follow you a lot more than they should otherwise, so that's something to keep in mind is that you might not be as safe going to the small camp, but you might be safer going to the hard camp for instance, and then you can use your summons to be out ahead of you sort of scouting, and then you can play behind them. So, you know, I could do something like Grave Chill the Creeps, and then I can go and put my birds over here, and keep Visage back here, and then, you know, my birds are in the way of any rotations coming through, so if we did get rotated on, I can pop a stun really easily, and then I can just slowly rotate out. That's a way to play with Visage. So with Nature's Prophet, obviously because he likes to split the map a bit more, he's a little bit different, so after I take this tier 1 tower here, what I typically want to be doing is, again, in the same way, forcing attention to the tier 2 and forcing people to defend. But since Nature's Prophet doesn't take fights as well, uh, if they under-rotate, what you want to end up doing instead is then just looking at where your team is and how you can rotate and to help them. So, say if there was a fight breaking out mid, for example, and I looked here and saw there was a fight, I might ult and then I'll connect just behind to come and flank the back line. So I teleport in, I might um, sprout somebody, keep them in place, then deal a bunch of damage, and while that's happening, my creeps are up here doing damage. You can always, without looking, you know, I could just go select all other units and then hit attack move down the lane on the minimap, and that will work just fine. Otherwise, if there's no team fights breaking out and you just want to keep pressure up and keep rotations, then I'd always be rotating in wherever the creep wave is, and just looking to reinforce the creep wave. So here everything's just died, but that's fine. But you always want to take out the archer first whenever you can. So take the archer out, that decreases the total amount of damage that their creep wave is doing. And then we just throw those up the wave, throw those back in. The second we meet any sort of resistance, then I'm just going to go back top. And then I just do the same thing again. So select all of these guys, select them on the archer, select my own hero. There we go. And then throw that down the lane. You can always come back here, see what's going on, see that that tower's dropped. So yeah, the Sun Edge Prophet likes to play is that he likes to split push, and then whenever he can, he likes to, if he's got his teleport up, ult, and then connect. You win a fight, you pick off the weak backliner or whatever you need to do, and then the second you get the chance again, you want to go and summon a bunch of creeps, sick them on the tower, and it's just rinse repeat. Uh, so let's move on to Broodmother. So with Broodmother, very similar to Visage, you want to, as soon as you hit level 6, you want to start building up a army of spiderlings, and then you just want to start brute forcing towers down, and then you want to build your webs, and then you want to just keep pressuring mid and top in this case, or mid and bot if you're playing for Dire. You just want to keep constant pressure on, and then just slowly start expanding your web into enemy territory, and then just constantly playing off of your webs. So since you get access to things like cliff walking, 
it forces the enemy team to get more and more out of position, which just buys space. So never be afraid to keep running as Brood, but I always like to try and play that edge wherever I can. So finding little spots where you can abuse, where you can stay out of vision and stay close enough so that the second that they start rotating away, then you can repressure the instant that they've left. The other thing you have is insatiable hunger. So if one or two heroes, say, do start to man up on you and you've got a plus one, for example, you often have enough to kill threat. So the second somebody starts going on you, you pop insatiable hunger and that will start healing you back up. And a lot of people underestimate, especially at level three, just how much damage Brood can do with a point in each skill. So Silk and Bola does a small amount of damage, slow, and then also applies a uh, miss chance. So they're going to miss a certain amount against you. You do get a little attack bonus as well. So you do a little bit of extra magical damage with each attack, which is always worth knowing. But yeah, the main thing is, is that you can, against certain heroes, if they're lazy about bringing numbers to counteract you, you can man up on them and actually end up killing them really easily. And you can snowball into the late game that way as well. So yeah, with Brood, she's another hero that doesn't like to rotate to fights. She likes to keep pressure on. The ideal scenario for her is that your team bait a fight, and then instead of hard committing, they continually just kite the fight back if they can, and just buy time for Brood. And then the whole time, she's just building up an army like this. And then the second they leave her alone for too long, she just takes an objective. So that's the way that she likes to play. So she'll take the top tier one, she goes and knocks on the door of the tier two, and then the second that she meets ample resistance that's when she backs off otherwise if she doesn't meet enough resistance then she just kills you and then yeah if she meets enough then she rotates and goes and takes mid instead brood is a hero that will play this sort of style where she will just aggressively start spinning webs and she'll just get further and further up the map and just make more and more space have an army like this and then a tower like this can drop really quickly even at this level even after i've lost all those creeps if i get say three creeps worth of spiders back up it's gonna die instantly. Anyway, even if I didn't have free spells on, you'll see that, you know, the cooldown for that is only nine seconds. So it's very feasible to get that up really often and have, you know, three creeps worth of spiders knocking on a tower. So she is always worth respecting if you're playing against her. And uh, she's definitely worth abusing if you're playing as her. So let's skip over to Beastmaster and Lycan now, because these two heroes have a slightly different playstyle. So a hero like Lycan, his first real power spike is the second that he gets the Helm of the Dominator. Since he's a hero that doesn't really rotate and likes to play off his ult whenever he's team fighting, what you really want to be doing wherever possible is dominating a creep and then spawning in your wolves. And then you really just want to be sitting in a lane and then knocking down objectives as much as you can. So with Lycan, since his feral impulse isn't tied to a direct area, you can play a little bit further back with Lycan. And then if I put a point in Hal, for example, I could reduce armor depending on if it's agility heroes, for instance, I want to do that to offset the armor that they're getting from Wraith Bands. But otherwise, you can come in here, you can do a bit of damage. And with Lycan, you never want to be afraid to use your ult to escape if you get heavily rotated on. Because as you can see here, he's not hugely tanky. What he gets is a bunch of additional regen. So he doesn't mind taking small instances of damage, but he doesn't like taking large bursts. So if you're against a really bursty lineup, never be afraid to just pop your ult and then leave, because you get to leave at hasted move speed, and then you can always just farm up a little bit more, and then go back and start pushing again. So he is a hero that likes to typically get a Helm of the Dominator, and then oftentimes go Helm of the Overlord. He just gets so much more benefit out of an item like that. So you end up dominating an Ancient creep. I've been over all of these abilities in the neutral videos that I did for the channel. So if you're interested in learning about neutral creep abilities, please go and watch that playlist. Otherwise, if you get a large creep like this, and then you end up throwing those down the lane and they are basically what does the majority of the damage for you. You're providing additional damage and additional HP regen to them. It's more feasible that by the time I get a Helm of the Dominator, I've got all my points there and maybe a point in Hal. So you can see that these creeps, I don't even need to be right next to them because I've got the wolves up. But you do want to be close enough that when the wolves are about to die, you can throw on more wolves. And then you can do things like give the... Um, Dominated creep, the additional attack speed, which I think is, yeah, that's what the frenzy does. Gives him the additional attack speed, so you can hold alt if you want. Press W to cast it on himself, and then you can see that he's doing a bunch of damage for you. Wait for the wolves to come back off cooldown, and I can throw them up there as well. 
And I don't even need to be in there doing, you know, getting my hands dirty to take that objective. I can send them in to do all the damage for me, and the enemy just have to respect that it's there. Otherwise, if I'm using those abilities, then I can quickly melt the creep wave, and then it's just a matter of time until those towers, towers drop. That's how you play Lycan. Similarly with Beastmaster, if I spawn him in. So it's, if you go and look in Dota 2 Pro Tracker, which I always advise people do whenever they're looking to learn new heroes, you will see that it is becoming meta now to, to go something like a Vlad's first and then build straight into the Helm of the Overlord and delay the Helm of the Dominator timing. The reason for that is that typically you want to hit that timing where you've got the inner beast maxed and then you've got your boars maxed before you get the Helm of the Dominator. You can find in certain lanes, especially if you're against a range carry, which are in vogue right now, that it's really difficult to get value out of your boars, so you have to end up going more points in Wild Axes instead. So there are a lot of people that are going Vlads instead for the additional protection and damage amp and stuff like that, and then playing around the Axes, and then building up to the Helm of the Overlord, and then once they've got the Helm of the Overlord, then they're doing the typical push strategy of having their creep and their boards, and then you do things like throw wild axes, and then throw whatever spells you have available, throw all the creeps down the lane, and then with Beastmaster, again you've got the same thing as Lycan, where he doesn't have a huge sack of hit points, but he doesn't have the additional HP regen that Lycan gets, so with Beastmaster you want to play more in the trees, and you want to just be giving your creeps your buffs, so let's run him back so he doesn't die, because keeping the Seder alive is good for damage. And then the boars can end up just damaging the tower if that one didn't die. I was lazy about it, that's fine. So you can see here that just sitting in, this is just purely based off inner beast attack speed. If I walk up, you can see that that's why Vlad's is really strong. So all the lane creeps are doing additional damage. They've got extra armor, extra mana regen. And they've also got 20% lifesteal, so they're always slightly healing too. You could do other things, that like you could go Greaves if you wanted the additional mana and stuff like that, but it's not something that you have to do. You could go Pipe of Insight if you need magic protection for the lane, because it's being nuked down from the magic damage. All sorts of things that you can do with these heroes where you like to build auras, and then you can literally just sit back and let your creeps do all the dodo work for you, and um, the enemy just have to respect it. So again, similar sort of playstyle, you go and knock on the front door, the second you meet resistance, you fall back because you don't want to be feeding these creeps if you don't have to. Otherwise, if they don't bring enough protection and you've got a plus one, then you can often just go for a kill. And that's very common with all summons heroes, is that it forces rotations in numbers, because if they don't bring the numbers and you've got somebody else there with you, you can often just get a free kill. So, most important thing to understand with these heroes is that you are tempo-based, you do want to be dominant in the early game. Biggest mistake I consistently see with players who are new to summons heroes is that they don't feel that urgency as soon as they get those skills on board to make the most of it, and they end up passively farming into a team that will always win late game against them. So you always want to be pushing the tempo, you always want to be pushing the pace. Summons heroes I find are really good for limit testing. You learn a lot about the game by just constantly throwing things and, you know, learning where your limits are in the hero of how long can I stick around, when do I have to leave, what is a rotation that looks like it's not enough look like. So I think a lot of the value in these heroes comes for building game sense in general. What points you're weak in the game, what points you're strong in the game, and when you can and can't rotate. Summons heroes do that really quickly. They force you to learn those because if you wait too long, you're nearly always going to lose the game. But yeah, th that's my biggest piece of advice is don't be afraid to push the pace with these heroes. Don't be afraid to spawn things in, throw things at the wall, and if you feed a little bit, that's fine. Like, every death should be a learning opportunity. You shouldn't feel like you can't learn from every death with a summons hero because you have the bodies to throw ahead of you so that you don't have to risk your hero. And um, if these summons die first, that's fine. If you can get them out, that's great. But you should never be afraid of feeding a summon over your own life. You should always be using them as a body to throw at the enemy that they have to respond to, and then using that as a way to get out, or a way to protect an ally so they can get out. Because more often than not, by the time that this creep has died, you've got the ability to bring in another creep as well. You can use in Beastmaster's case, your ult as just a stun to get away. You'll start to learn all of that when you can and can't play the push game, when you have to start falling back on other strategies that all of the other heroes present. Prue provides really good split push potential, as well as she can end up just manning up and building a bunch of aura items to make the team strong, and use Insatiable Hunger to lifesteal on top of. She could build Wraith Pact for the Vlad's aura that gives additional damage and bonus lifesteal. She can end up just going in and frontlining if you needed to. Otherwise, if the enemy are letting you play this push game, you can do that with Brood really well. With Beastmaster, you can 
throw axes from the back line. So I could just be, you know, back here throwing things like this. I could build Octarine Core. I could play around Blink, and I can just be constantly amping damage that the enemy is taking. Otherwise, I can Blink in, I can stun somebody to set up a fight. If somebody BKBs and they're going on somebody that I need to save, I can use my BKB piercing stun to stop them in their tracks. There's a way to play with Lycan, where you can play around a Scepter so that you bite an ally and give them all the shapeshift properties if they're the damage. So there, there's all sorts of ways that you can play these heroes around their abilities and not play the push. But the push is really, really strong. But yeah, with the game naturally coming to an end, because I pushed in all the lanes, I think that's a good place to call it. Um, as always, if you have any questions, any concerns about these heroes, anything that me or the team can clear up, please leave comments in the comments below, and one of us will get back to you. Besides that, I'll see you in the next video.